If you're tired of spending hours every day analyzing potential investment properties, listen up because I'm about to remove that roadblock for you by introducing you to the Backflip app. Not only does Backflip give you the ability to quickly analyze any property and at any time, it also allows you to apply for a loan with them directly through their app, which allows you to scale your business and do more profitable deals. It's a great tool because it instantly pulls all the data you need for a property, like the after repair value and the as is value. Plus, it gives you a curated list of high quality comps, and it's going to do that for you 60 times faster than if you were to go and do it by yourself by searching through the MLS or Zillow. So it's going to literally save you hours upon hours of work. And not only that, but the app will help you determine which strategy is the best fit for each particular property. So should you fix and flip it for a profit or should you rehab it and rent it out? And so you'll immediately know if this particular property fits into your portfolio or if you should just move on to another deal. With Backflip, you're now going to be able to jump on good investments quickly and with confidence. So go down to the show notes of this show, click on the Backflip link, Download the app, start analyzing your deals today, and work with Backflip to fund the next deal you do. All right, so you guys ever see on social media where people will post, I own 5,000 doors, or I own 2,500 doors of real estate, or I own 100 units with 3,000 doors. Anybody ever ever see that? I, I know I do, and I understand the real estate game, so I know the truth, but I want to break it down for those of you who may not understand What's going on with these people who own so much real estate and and then break it down into more educational piece on what are the two different types of real estate. There's more than two, arguably, because you could break them down into subgroups, but we'll break it down into the two main types of real estate. But I first want to address what that means when you guys see that, because I feel like a lot of times it can make us feel as though we're lagging behind. You're like, man, I don't have any yet. This guy's got 2000 doors or, you know, somebody like myself, I own 20 something doors, but this person owns 3000. What am I doing? Well, let me break it down for you so I can make it make sense. These folks, these big names, I'm not going to say any big names because they're not doing anything wrong. I just want to clarify it for you. These big names, all the big names that you see in the real estate space, who claim to have all these doors, these thousands or tens of thousands of units, they don't own these outright. And oftentimes they own very, 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 very small percentages of all of those doors that they're claiming to have. What they do is what's called either, there's really two different ways to structure it, uh, syndications, or real estate funds, investment funds. And so if they do a syndication, they will go, a real estate investor will go, find this huge commercial building. So let's say like an apartment complex and it has 200 doors, okay? Then they will go find accredited investors, okay? I, I don't remember all the, the details of being an accredited investor, but I think it's you gotta have at least a million dollars net worth or you make like 250,000 more a year. And there's a couple different stipulations, okay? But they'll, they'll get these accredited investors and they will raise money needed for the down payment in any rehab they're going to do. Okay. So the guys who go and raise the money are known as what we call GPs or general partners in these deals, in these funds or in these syndications. We'll talk about syndication on this specific example. And then everybody who invests their money are called LPs or limited partners. Now, not all the time. But oftentimes, the LPs have a lot more money in the deal than the GPs. See, the GPs, the general partners, all these guys that you see on social media acting like they have all these units, they are just really good fundraisers. And they raise all this capital, and then they pay themselves a fee for managing it all, a very hefty fee, and they make a lot of money. Think of it like a almost like a fund manager, a hedge fund manager in the stock market, but for real estate. And so when they say, and so let me take a step back. That's one way you can do it. You can raise money per deal. That's called a syndication. Or another way they may do it is they'll do it through a real estate fund. You can call it all different types of things, but it's just a fund. And let's say they're going to raise, you know, $50 million or $100 million. They'll raise all this money from investors. Then they'll go deploy that money as they see fit into these big deals. 
Well, then the ones who are on social media decide to get on social media and tell everybody in their bio, well, I have 5,000 units. And I'm not saying they're not telling the truth, okay? Because they're involved in a transaction of 5,000 units. But they own themselves a very, 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 very small majority, the majority of the time of those actual deals. Because it's the limited partners who are really carrying the weight and have a lot of equity and reap a lot of benefits from the actual units themselves, where the general partners are the ones that are reaping a lot of the benefits from the fees. Now, will they invest some of their money themselves? Yes, because that's a great way for them to raise money. Think of it. They're going to give a sales pitch why somebody should buy this big apartment complex with them. They say, well, you know, I'm putting in $100,000 of my own money into this deal, you know, or $200,000. And so it's good for a sales pitch. But just understand that they are playing a fundraising game. They didn't go out and buy 2,000, 5,000, 8,000 units on their own, 8,000 doors on their own, okay? I wanted to clear that for, clarify that for everybody because I remember when I was new in real estate, I didn't understand it. And I'm like, how does somebody buy this much? Okay, how does somebody go and buy this much real estate? Well, they don't. You, know, they, they manage the transaction. They find the deals, but it's somebody else's money, okay? So I won't harp on that anymore. Just wanted to clarify that for everybody because it can be, um, you know, it can be confusing and then demoralizing for some of you who are just starting to not comprehend it. Me, I invest in those funds. My best friend has a fund like that and you can make good money. So there's nothing wrong investing in your money into them. As far as me doing that structure, I really like the idea of owning my own portfolio. Okay. I also don't love the idea of me raising and managing a bunch of people's money. I don't want to do that. That's not what I am trying to do. I have been able to build a life-changing residential portfolio while continuing to work my job, while continuing to be at my kids' sporting events and coach them and be at all the practices and without having the stress of managing 50 million of somebody else's money. Now, if you want to go and do that for a living, that's fine. It's going to have to be a full-time job, but you got to start somewhere. You got to know how the real estate game works. Let me tell you, the guys who, who are doing this, they all started with what I teach, with the single family homes, with the small residential up to the quadplexes, because that gives you the groundwork needed to then go to those larger deals should you want to structure one of those one day. <laughs> When I set out on my real estate journey five years ago, I wasn't exactly sure what the outcome was going to be, but I knew based on history that people who had bought this asset and held it over time, it had completely changed their lives. It had given them life-changing wealth. It had given them time freedom, and it had given them financial freedom. And I knew that I wanted that for myself and my family. Fast forward from 2018 to today, and it has completely changed changed our lives. It has completely changed my family tree because I said yes. I took that step forward into buying this asset that has proven itself time and time again for centuries. And so if you're still on the sidelines and you have yet to start buying real estate, or maybe you have a few properties, but you've ran into roadblocks and you haven't been able to scale and add the volume you needed to have that huge impact on your life, then I want to invite you into our rental academy community where you're going to be linked up with investors all across the country. You're going to have coaching multiple times a week from myself and our entire panel of world-class coaches. You're gonna be given all the knowledge and know-how that you need to be successful in real estate, the calculators, the templates, the guides, the lending partners, the insurance partners, the LLC partners, all of it. We're gonna teach you everything you need to know to be successful in real estate investing, and then we're gonna be there with you along the journey, hold your hand and guide you so that you can have the opportunity to reach and achieve financial freedom like I and so many of our students and people across the country have. So when you're ready to say yes, text the word WIN, W-I-N, to 871-861-9264. Set up a time to chat with myself or somebody on our team so that we can go on this journey with you and help you achieve the life of your dreams. <laughs> Thank you.
And so that leads me into the two really main types of real estate that can be broken down into subgroups. But there, we'll, for, the, for the sake of this episode, we'll, we'll leave it to two different main types. You've got residential and you've got commercial. When you hear residential real estate, I want you to think of a single family home up to a quadplex. Single family home up to a quadplex. The bank considers that residential. Once you get past a quadplex, the bank will not lend to those deals like they would a traditional home. But a bank will lend you a quadplex, the same type of loan as they would a single family home. So then when we get into commercial, anything above a quadplex in the residential space is going to be commercial. You got your uh, like apartment complex, things of that nature. Uh, you have your warehouses, you have your shopping strips, you have uh, restaurants, you have you know potentially storage units could fall into commercial real estate or maybe alternative real estate. And so that's what really separates the two, those criteria right there. Now, how they operate is totally different. Now, I already gave you the whole spiel at the beginning about how people raise money for these big commercial deals, whether it be residential commercial deals or you know business type commercial deals. So we know how they raise the money for it. But when it comes to actually finding and analyzing and how we value them, they're totally, totally separate. Commercial and residential are totally separate. So when we look at valuing residential properties, it's very easy. It's based on the market. So if we're looking at a three bedroom, two bathroom home, all we're going to do is we're going to look in that area, in that neighborhood that we're interested in our three bedroom, two bathroom home in and see, okay, what have other homes in this area sold for recently that are three bedroom, two bath? And so I always tell my students in the rental academy, I say, you guys can give me any residential property and within five minutes or less, I can tell you what it's worth. So it's very easy and very accessible to be able to analyze the deal. Everybody knows what it's worth because it's, it's public information. When you are analyzing a commercial deal, it's based oftentimes off of your net operating income and what's called a cap rate, which just tells you how specific property is going to yield in any given year. And so if you were to buy a 200 unit apartment complex, there's most likely not a comp that you can go pull on Zillow or any other website in the same neighborhood that tells you what 200 unit apartment complexes are selling for, right? Even if you would, even if you could, that's not how they're valued, but you can't, like, it's just not possible to do. Every commercial building's usually so different that they're not apples to apples. So they base the value of commercial properties strictly on the income or, or how the property is producing. And so what these guys will do oftentimes is they will go and they'll buy undervalued properties, quote unquote, uh, commercial properties. And what I mean by that is properties that they can buy and then do something to it to increase the income, essentially broken down. There's more that goes into it, but just a high level view. And so they may buy an ugly apartment building, say we can get the grounds looking good. We can paint the exterior, just throwing examples out there. And then we know that if we can, you know, raise each, if we can spend five to 8,000 per door in renovations, then we can raise income X amount. And if we do that, then that's going to take the property being worth, you know, we're all in at 1 million to now based on the income a cap rate is bringing in. Now this property is worth 1.8 million or now it's worth 2.2 million. And so whatever the number is, we now have all of this equity. We're cash flow. And now we have all this equity. So we can either do two things. They can either go and sell that property and you know pay their investors back plus their profits and then go reinvest into another deal. Or they can do a refinance and pull everybody's capital back. That's what they try to do oftentimes. If you invest in these syndications or these funds, they'll, they'll try to find a way to be able to get your initial capital back oftentimes through a refinance. And then everybody will just start taking profits from the cash flow and then obviously ultimately on the sale on the back end. And there's a lot of different ways that you structure these. Not everybody does it the same, but just giving you a broad idea of how these work. Now, this is getting in the weeds here, but figured, 
you know, it, it'd be interesting for you guys to hear at the time of this recording, which is June of 2023, commercial real estate, in my opinion, is in a lot of trouble. Okay. So folks who went out and raised money, remember earlier in this episode, I told you they would go and raise money from investors, right? To buy these properties. And let's say the bank wanted 30% down three years ago when they raised their money. A lot of times these guys will do these renovations over time and they'll be on like a five-year plan to refi in year five, something along those lines. Well, when they do that, they have to project what they think they're going to be able to pull, how much money they're going to be able to pull out in year five and what the interest rates will be with the new loan when they refinance into a new loan at year five. What happened is a lot of these commercial folks got into deals three years ago when rates were very low. They're probably buying commercial properties at four and a half, five percent Well, now, 2023, anybody who needs to refinance, rates for these commercial loans for these big apartment complexes may be anywhere from eight and a half to 10%, okay? So rates are almost double what they were expecting them to be. And not only that, banks now want 50% equity, as a down payment. So they only had to put 30% in originally, but if they go refinance now, not only are the rates going to be a lot higher than they were expecting, but now they got to have cash to cover to cover that additional equity that the bank wants them to have in the deal. And so they are running into some issues to say the least. Now, will there be people who make it through? Yep. But there will be a lot of commercial deals, big commercial deals that come on the market because um, a, a lot of these guys' numbers can't work and there's going to be investors who lose money. So just a little lesson here for what's going on here in 2023. But then when we look at residential, you know, I mentioned um, it's, it's easy to get into them. Uh, it's easy to analyze them because we can see um, what everything's worth. But the cool thing about residential real estate is, is this. Think, think about any product or service that appeals to the masses. You put yourself in a better position to have success, right? Would you agree? I mean, look at Amazon. It appeals to the masses. They have a huge market cap because they can reach anybody and everybody. When we deal with single family homes, that's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with an asset that appeals to the masses because think, what is the American dream? The American dream is to own a home. And so as a, from an investor standpoint, that benefits us greatly in a lot of different ways. Number one, banks love to loan to single family homes. Think about the asset they lend to the most, single family homes, right? They send, they send loans out for homes all the time. So if you need a loan on a home as an investor, Easy. That's what banks do, right? That's what banks do. We've already talked. It's easy to analyze these deals. We know what our numbers are going to be. We can find what rents are. We can find what it's going to be worth. When we look at acquiring tenants, think about the type of people who want to live in an apartment compared to want to live in a house. Now, people who want to live in an apartment are not bad people. I'm not talking about morally how good these people are or how bad they are. But when we think of somebody who wants to live in a three bedroom, two home or three bed, two bed, three bedroom, two bath, excuse me, house compared to somebody who wants to live in a little apartment, there is an opportunity for us to have better tenants because these people may have families or they want to settle down some roots and get in a home and somewhere that really feels homey instead of just a little apartment building. And then when we look at exit strategies, we talked about it pills to the masses. Think about when these big commercial investors, when they go to sell, who do you think they can sell it to? You think they're going to sell it to you know, Joe Blow, who's trying to buy a property? No, it's going to be millions of dollars. They can only sell it to other investors, right? And if their numbers didn't add up and they get hit by the bank with interest rates and everything else, they're going to have to sell it at a discount. Whereas with a single family home, we can go sell it to other investors. And there's a lot of benefits to that that I don't have time to explain on this episode. Or we can make it pretty, fix it up and sell it to the public because it appeals to the masses and everybody's dream is to have a home. And so there are so many benefits to both. You can be successful in both, okay? But when we're looking at our lives, when you're looking at your life, you have to say, what do I want to do for a living? If you want to be a fundraiser for a living, you know, check out some commercial stuff, the bigger commercial stuff. Now, can you go buy you know, smaller commercial properties yourself, a warehouse by yourself, a small warehouse. Yes. Okay. And, I, and I'm talking more about on the grander scale. 
So yes, you can do that. And there's, it's fine. Those are fine. There can be good returns. They have what's called triple net leases where all you have to pay is your mortgage and the, the tenants will cover everything else. That's nice. Oftentimes the returns aren't quite as large, but the stability is there. Cause once you get a tenant, like in a warehouse or in a restaurant, things of that nature, uh, they, they can tend to be there for a decent amount of time and they have to fix the place up how they want. So a lot of times, or sometimes there's value added to your building without you having to do it. So there's, there's benefits, um, to that. But when we're just looking at, Hey, I'm, I am newer to this. I'm trying to get into this. I'm trying to buy my first property. I'm trying to scale to my third, fourth, fifth property. I would encourage you guys until you get a good grasp. And unless you're just saying, I just want to raise money for a living to really focus in and learn how to do residential real estate. You are opening yourself up to an asset that is common in our country. And so you're giving yourself the best chance um, with the smallest amount of risk, in my opinion, to be successful as you're newer to investing by investing in residential real estate. And I think there's been like some romanticism put around multifamily. People just hear the word multifamily and they're like, oh, that's just what I want to buy. They don't even know why. Um, and there's nothing wrong with it. You know, there's nothing wrong with duplex, triplex, quadplex. Look. I, I look to buy those as well. Um, but man, it is really hard to beat single family homes. If you talk to all the folks who, you know, talk about having all these units and owning all these units, uh, because they do the syndications. If you looked at their personal portfolio, you'll see a lot of single family homes. They're raising money to buy this commercial. Cause that's another way for them to create income just off of their fees. But if you look at their personal portfolio, you're going to see stacked up a lot of homes. Trust me. I know all these guys. I'm friends with big name folks who like to present this idea of doing these large deals all the time, but um, they have a strong residential portfolio in their back pocket. And that's what got them to where they are today to have the clout and the experience to then to be able to expand and do some other things with other investors. So anyways, wanted to break this down for you guys to give some clarity on the two types of real estate, the benefits of each, the cons of each, um, because you know they, their money can be made in a lot of different ways. It's just important for us to decide what do we want in life, choose what we're going to go do, focus on it, and then attack it. And if we do that and we choose real estate as the tool, uh, we can feel pretty confident that it's going to lead us to where we want to go.